So hi everyone, um, I'm Drew, and today I'm going to talk about how to design reusable components in Ember 2. Um, well, first thing I have to say is like, that's really not true, <laughs> because Ember 2 just came out today, so... <laughs> um, but I really needed to find a good title for the talk, so I just went for it. <laughs> um, the actual story is like how we build a calendar component in Ember 112. <laughs> But that's not actually true either, because we plan to build a calendar component in Ember 112. But since Ember is quite a move, like a fast-moving target, when we actually got to the step of actually building the component, Ember 113 was already out there, which I think is quite good because probably will work in Ember 2 as well, hopefully. Um, so I lied quite a lot in like 45 seconds <laughs> of the talk, but 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 but. Um, we tried to do the things in the Ember 2 way. Um, and the Ember 2 way, we've just like figured out by reading articles and blogs and RFCs and stuff like that. So hopefully, some of the lessons we've learned along the way uh, will be interesting. So what did we build? Um, it's a calendar. So I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with Google Calendar. You click add occurrences. You can resize occurrences. You can drag and drop occurrences. <coughs> Um, as a software developer, I'm sure that you know like what are our nemesis, like in our craft, which are naming things, cache invalidation, time zones, something else. Off by one hours. Off by one Well, <laughs> time zone support. <laughs> so one of the things we had to build in the calendar is time zone support, which was interesting. I think Eugenio spent something like three, four weeks, months into making time zone support like work. But in the end, we got to the point where we had uh, Ember Calendar with time zone support, where you could search for time zones, you could set um, a time zone, it would actually work, which was amazing. Um, but why? So I think <coughs> right now, in, with Ember 2, the right way to go is to switch to components. But when we started, we didn't really know that, or maybe we had an intuition that the direction was that one. But the main reason we did that is because we needed this calendar in a lot of different places. So we have a lot of apps which need some sort of calendar. Their needs are a bit different. So we thought, well, we might just well, as well extract it in a, in, a, in a shared component and use that in all the separate apps. And that was the initial idea, because the first time we just like, built like two different calendars. And at some point, it's like, OK, I need this on the other app as well, and just felt wrong. Um, so the actual business is connecting people together with a phone call most of the time. So we have four offices in four different time zones. So time zone support is quite important, especially because otherwise you schedule a call with some guy in the, in the United States, and he just like forgets to show up or stuff like that, which is unfortunate. Um, so for, I don't know if you can see quite a lot, but this is one of our internal apps, which our colleagues use for scheduling calls. And this uh, fully built uh, on Ember. And here is the calendar in action. This is one of the apps. And this is another app that the clients are using. <coughs> and even this one is using the calendar. Can I get a um, glass of water? Yeah, of course. Thank you. OK, demo time. So it's running. Good. So we have the calendar here. Um, so as I said, you click at an event, click at another event. You can resize events. You can take and drag and drop events around. You can navigate over stuff, add more stuff, jump back to your week. Um, the Kellen, the time zone, thank you. The time zone support works. So <laughs> so we're in Europe, London. And for example, you could want to switch to New York. <coughs> and all the events just like go up. Um, if these are like uh, the, where our main offices are, so that's um, the default query for showing the time zones. But if you wanted to search for a different time zone, let's say Rome, just like pop up, you could choose it, and the events would adjust accordingly. Um, so yeah, time zone works good. Um, something I'm quite proud personally is uh, <laughs> building this drag and drop because if you uh, notice, it also works when you're like going around the page. Oh, not anymore. 
<laughs> Obviously, I broke it. Um, and also, it's a bit smart because it tries to be inertial. So if you start dragging at the bottom of the vent and you go up, then it will start dragging again only when you get to that point and stuff like that. It's a lot of manipulation. In the end. Um, but enough about that. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about the general architecture of the thing. Um, so this is the calendar. Um, you call it, you pass a list of currencies. And this is the data that, tr that the calendar is using to populate all the events. And then you specify what you want the calendar to do whenever one of these user interactions happen. So whenever someone clicks, the calendar will call the action that you have passed, passing you some data along with it. Um, whenever someone tries to do update some of the occurrences, we'll call calendar update occurrence. Whenever someone tries to remove an occurrence, we'll try to <laughs> call the calendar remove occurrence. I think it's quite short, this example, but it's quite um, interesting because um, how many of you is familiar with the data down, actions up paradigm? Good. So basically, it means that whenever you're using a component, you should pass data down to this component. And this component should take this data and treat it as holy. It should never touch it. It should never modify it, well, to a certain extent. But instead, whenever a user interaction happens, you should call an action and send it up to the upper context. And the upper context really knows what needs to be done. Um, so in this example, let's say we have on add occurrence. And the calendar will know that whenever a user clicks on the grid, you will send up this action, which is calendar add occurrence. So whenever we write this template, um, that's the context that we're using. And therefore, in the controller, or maybe it should be uh, like another component, we should define this action, which is calendar add occurrence, where we get this occurrence, we get all the occurrences, <coughs> we validate the thing that we're trying to add. And if the validation succeeds, then we actually add the occurrence. Um, I think this is, at, at least when we started doing this, um, it was very much the way to go. And I think in number two, it's more, more than so. Is, I think it's quite the suggested way to go to build components. And it's called data down, actions up, because of this reason. So you pass data down. And it's especially evident once you have a structure of nested components. So the data is always passed from the top level component down, down, down. And from the, like, last, from the last level of the components, you send actions up to the top level context. Um, the advantage of doing this is, first of all, you know whenever you, even if you have a huge structure of nested components, that only the top level is actually mutating data. So you don't have those nasty bugs because some of the small components is touching something and some other small components touching something else. And then you don't know really who is controlling state. Um, as a funny thing, we actually, whenever you're doing occurrences, my occurrences, in, the cat, in, the, in this Ember component, we actually proxy the data internally. Because at that time, whenever you're passing um, variables to a component, there was a two-way data binding. I think in Ember 2 now, this has not, it's not the case anymore. You have to explicitly say that you want the two-way binding to happen with uh, mute, right? Or that's 2-1. When you get the angle bracket component, okay. it become one way by default. OK. So what we do is, just like to avoid that, we proxy. We have like an internal occurrence object. We just proxies your real objects. And the component always sends the actions up. And we always let the upper context decide, because the upper context really knows what to do. And the, one of the <coughs> advantages that we've found is, for example, all the validation logic does not need to belong to the calendar. The calendar is quite dumb. It just knows, OK, someone clicked there. But you, you're, right, you're using this um, add-on. And you know what is the business logic that you want to apply. So you know whenever something is valid, something is invalid. And we do the same thing, for example, when people try to um, drag uh, one event on top of one another. Because there may, might be applications where you can actually have overlapping events, and there might be other applications where you shouldn't have overlapping events. 
but it's not a responsibility of the component to know that. OK. Um, obviously, since uh, we're trying to use this component in multiple applications, we want to customize the behavior. So we can't really use this all the time, because sometimes we just want to do something different. Um, the way of customizing this is by passing a block to the component. And in, in our component, we pass as uh, variables within the block the um, event, the grid, and the actual calendar component. So you can use <coughs> these uh, variables to access information if you want to. Um, and this block uh, has a default block. Th this component has a default block, which just calls an acid component, which is called timetable occurrence. And it gets occurrence. It gets some information like how high the time slot should be, how long is that time slot. It passes the grid, so the timetable know actually like where to draw stuff. And also, the nested component has some actions, which then call the parent component. Uh, and this is the default block. So whenever you're using the simple syntax, the calendar actually uses this. Um, but for example, we have another app where we have a lot of uh, editable events and fixed events. So you should be able to change all the editable events, but you shouldn't be able to change the fixed events. So for example, now here we're doing, we're checking if the actual occurrence is editable. And if it is, we're using the smart version of occurrence, which is called timetable occurrence. If it's not, we're just using the dumb version, which is called occurrence. So basically, in this way, we can manage this calendar with a lot of fixed events and a lot of editable events. Um, yeah. Testing. Um, <laughs> yes, testing. Um, so <laughs> when we started testing this, we followed the um, Amber practice of unit testing components. I'm not sure how many of you actually tried, but it's a huge pain. Um, you need to define like all the dependencies, and then do this sort of like weird stopping of things. And uh, at the end, you work like three days writing these tests, and you try to read them from top to bottom. You can't really understand anything. <coughs> or, like I don't know what this thing is doing, and it's. It, especially frustrating when the test like fails at some point. Um, I think the new way in number two of doing things is, has a weird <coughs> name, but it's pretty sweet. The weird name is component integration unit test. It's still a unit test, so you go, you, you look in the folder like tests, unit, and component stuff. But actually, it's an integration test. So you can click, you can fill fields, you can assert stuff, you can actually do things. It's pretty amazing. Um, the way to enable this is whenever you're uh, writing a test, you pass this integration true. I've just seen today there's this, this deprecation notice which says that this is going to be the default behavior from at some point. And if you actually want a true unit test, you have to pass unit true. So I think. That's a, a good like, symptom that this is the way to go. Um, and this is, I, I really like this. Um, basically, there's this HPS like, string decorator. And you can render your a particular version of your component. You can pass all the options that you want. And the test will take your component, will run with you using these variables, that you, this information, this data that you pass in. And then you can make uh, assertions on this specific version of the calendar, um, which is nice because there's, <coughs> since this is quite a big component, there's a lot of options. And so I don't want to have a huge test, which I can't really understand. In this way, you can have 10 different tests. And e in each one of the tests, can just test one single thing. Um, something that's also really nice is that here, if you see, we have occurrences and calendar add occurrence. But since the actual component doesn't <laughs> store data and does, doesn't even really know what to do uh, when calendar add occurrence happens, you have to define these things on the test itself. So you set the, the data there. We just set occurrences to a number array. And we tell the test what to do whenever he receives the action calendar add occurrence, add occurrence. So in this case, we just take all the occurrence and we just add it to the list. And then we have the actual test. 
So we select a time, we've created these helpers to be able to select the first time slot of this first day, and then we check that actually one occurrence has been added to the calendar. Um, since we want to use this component <coughs> in a lot of apps, we don't really want to repeat the work that we like the really painful work that we had to do to make all those helpers work. So <coughs> the component also um, exposes these test helpers. I think my voice went out at rightly the exact time. That's it, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> so actually, it was me and Eugenio who built this thing. So I'm sure that Eugenio is available to answer all the questions that you have. Does anyone have any questions? If you have any questions, but please do, yes. Mm, by default, if you don't set that, by default, whenever you're calling this, Amber will try to, okay, I want to load AS calendar. So we'll try to find, find a template for it. <coughs> you will see that within the template, you're using other components. So we'll tell you, I have no idea what you're talking about. So usually you need to set a huge list of all the dependencies for this component. So you say, I need this, I need moment, I need this other component, I need this list of six helpers I'm using in my views. If you set the integration true, you won't have to do any of that. All that kind of stuff is automatic load it is loaded automatically for you. Yes, which is comp it's real I mean it's good if the component is really small, but if you have a deep nested structure of components, just <coughs> like crazy, because you have to specify all the possible dependencies of of every nested component, which is not a good <coughs> yeah? Is the uh, open source? Yes, uh, it's on GitHub. So, uh, well, I don't have internet, but it's on um, Alpha Sites Ember Calendar. So. And you can install it as an add-on, add right? Yes, yes. Um, by default, there are some styles which I've shown you which require like our own CSS framework, but they're not required at all. So you can write your own CSS if you're brave enough. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Can you go back to your slide on the testing? Um, sure. So on the checking um, which one? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, that one. Yes. Um, your assert for equal, there's a lovely helper that I've been helping upgrade to Ember 2. Mm -hmm. um, expect elements and expect components. Okay. You can just say expect elements dot as standard parameter. Oh, okay. Um, and it also has options where you say I want to this one. Oh, okay, yeah, that's nice. Uh, component name and for elements. One thing I forgot to mention is that uh, actually in these component in integration tests, you can't really use the integration helpers. So you still need to like fetch the element in jQuery and call click on it and stuff like that. <coughs> Which is not really great, but I still think it's okay. I still, like, at least you can still read the code, and the code makes some sense. So I like that. Yes? No? More? Yeah, I was just going to mention the, um, <coughs> the pre-processing of handlebars in line is a, um, it's called a tagged template string. Tagged template string. Tagged template string, and that, that's a proposed spec for ES7, I think. So mm -hmm. that will be a browser native thing, but right now, this is implemented as a like Babel plugin. Babel plugin that talks to the HTML HTML bar compiler. So it's quite fun. If you use this in one of your integration tests and then open it up, open up the compiled source in the browser, you'll see what a compiled HTML bar template looks looks like sat there right in the middle of your test. It's not as hairy as you'd think. Also makes my Vim highlighter just go completely insane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Of, um, like, a lot of the data on the page. 
Um, so, so can you? We, we have a problem where basically um, there's quite a lot of um, forms that are unique. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, um, it seems like the younger way is to basically pass like, the form of the curves into each of the inputs and like, do a, a whole heap of manual templating, which is like, particularly ugly. Um, yeah. Because, because basically, um, actions don't bubble up the DOM, they bubble straight to the router. I think we went like both ways at some point. Like at some point, we're just like doing stuff like <coughs> automatically inferring the parent component from an SE component. There is a way of doing that, but after some time doing that, we just like felt like it was too painful, and we just like started passing it explicitly. So, for example, all the input components, we just always pass the form in. <coughs> at some point, it's just better because you. You are much f like you have much more freedom in how, in how you want to um, nest the components, so you don't have to infer it from some certain magical structure that you have in the code. We, I, I don't like it, but I, I think that's like the best way we've found. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There is some dirty tricks that you can do, <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> the, the way that we've done it is just um, create more components. So if you have this table, then you create a component which is called table header, table footer, table, uh, table content, table footer. And maybe sometimes you still have some sensible defaults, but whenever you want to customize only the header, then you just repeat the whole structure. I don't think it's great, but still better than the dirty hacks that we found, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay.